want to talk for uh, for just a little bit about a very different uh, Neolithic uh, environment, the uh, the rise of farming in Mesoamerica. And here's uh, Helena Keys, uh, a cave site uh, in uh, in um, uh, Mesoamerica uh, that uh, is a good example um, uh, of that uh, that change. Uh, the site of Helena Keys is uh, uh, in Oaxaca. It's in uh, present-day Mexico. And um, the, the dates for it are um, uh, about, about the same as, uh, as sort of uh, uh, later Jericho, or early Shadal about um, 8700 uh, to 6700 BC, or about uh, uh, 11 to uh, 1011, maybe to about, uh, uh, about eight or 9,000 years ago. Um, it is a site that was not occupied year-round. It's only been occupied uh, probably August to December. And again, this is one of the, the, the moments when uh, paleoethnobotany is really useful and, and zooarchaeology are really useful for telling you about, um, about the environment that people were living in and that, how that's relevant socially. Uh, we know that some animals are born only in certain parts of, uh, of the year. And uh, therefore, if you have, say, um, you know, a three-month-old deer and all of the deer are born, you know, February, March, and April, then you're dealing with a site that's only occupied or that's, that, that was occupied in uh, early and mid-summer. Uh, and if you never find any um, uh, nine-month, ten-month-old, eleven-month, twelve-month-old uh, of those deer, then you know that site was probably not being occupied uh, in, in the winter when the deer would have been uh, of those ages. And the same could be true with plants, you know, which only flower or produce certain kinds of, of fruits at certain times of the year. So we know that, Gil that Gila Nakis was only occupied uh, for part of the year. Um, so one would imagine that this then represents a, um, a, a site if we you know, want to take all that we know about farming in the old world, in, in, Mesoamer excuse me, in Mesopotamia, in the, the Middle East, and in Europe, and uh, if we take everything we know about it from there, we'd imagine that this is going to be a hunter-gatherer site, right? You don't, um, you, you have to be, uh, um, uh, if you're mobile and you're only staying in a, one place for part of the year, you're probably not going to be farming. But we actually do uh, see some traces of domesticated uh, plants in in this place. We have a very small number of squash seeds that show signs of domestication. Um, of course, here in Mesoamerica, in, uh, in, in Mexico, present-day Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, El uh, Salvador, that area, we're dealing with a different set of plants. Uh, most of which were not found in uh, meso uh, in uh, the old world, and so it's a completely different set of plants that were domesticated. Um, corn, beans, squash are the the sort of traditional plant domesticates of uh, of the new world, which were not available, were not uh, found in the old world, and so the plants that were farmed farmed in the old world in in um, the Middle East. Um, uh, wheat and barley and emmer and einkorn and, and uh, grasses like that were not farmed here in uh, Mesoamerica. So one of the, the takeaways here that we'll, we'll touch on is that the way farming took place, as well as uh, the crops that were being farmed, was different in Mesoamerica than it was in the Old World. And Kielanakis is, is an interesting example of that. Uh, here is a, uh, a, a map of uh, the, uh, the Valley of Oaxaca, the, um, uh, the area where Gila Keys is, uh, is located. So here is um, present-day Oaxaca City. And here's Gila Keys over this side on the, the uh, eastern end of this um, uh, uh, map. Um, the interesting thing about this is that there's an, a lot of different resources available in the area immediately around Gila Keys. So uh, you've got uh, lower altitude uh, river valleys, uh, you've got higher altitude Piedmont areas, sort of more temperate, and, and rather much higher and cooler um, steppe mountain areas. Different animals are going to be um, uh, available, uh, and plants are going to be available in different ones of these, these resources. So you get mesquite and hackberries from the grasslands down by the river bottom below. Um, you, uh, you're going to get uh, acorns and agave from the higher up. Uh, areas. You might get a little rabbit and deer hunted from sort of all over these different areas, but different ones at different seasons. 
And as I said before, an interesting element of Helenikes is this, this really small number of squash seeds that show some signs of domestication. And it's a really small number is the key. It's not a very huge uh, a percentage of the diet. But we definitely have a little indication that there's a little farming going on. These seeds have been modified over time by human interaction more substantially than just a little modification of the landscape. So, so you know, it, it may be um, a relatively small squash patch that's farmed and left probably un, uh, un, um, untended for some period of the year while people go and spend their time elsewhere. Uh, it may be something that is, um, is farmed uh, just for part of the year uh, that they are resident in this area. Uh, the, the folks here, though, are concerned to not put all of their, uh, their eggs in one basket, like we were talking about with the risk that uh, it comes with farming. And that risk was certainly the case in the old world. Here in, in the new world, in Mesoamerica, uh, people were much more uh, careful and much... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Much less interested in committing all the way to becoming 100% farmers early on, at least in this time, um, you know, uh, up to about uh, 8,000, 9,000 years ago, uh, the period that uh, Helenikes was occupied. Farming and agriculture, or horticulture in the New World, didn't develop uh, in in sort of one relatively quick move as it did uh, in in the Old World. Over five, six, ten generations in the old world, people switched probably from mostly uh, gathering and hunting to, to mostly farming in, uh, in the Levant, in the Mideast. Here, it looks like that process was much more drawn out. It was much more um, slowly adopted, and people were, were sort of dabbling in farming. They understood it perfectly well. They knew what they were doing early on from 11... Um, thousand years ago almost, uh, we have signs of domestication. So not much after, really, the, the beginning of farming in, uh, in the Levant, um, uh, just one or two thousand years uh, later. But uh, the, the folks here in Mesoamerica didn't jump directly into, uh, into farming and stay there. So here's uh, the, the wrap-up on Hill and the Keys. It's, uh, uh, there's the dates, um, about 8700 to 6700 BC. Uh, really the earliest signs of, of uh, some of the earliest signs of agriculture in the New World. But that agriculture is being used supplementary. Um, the signs of, it really would have been horticulture, if you want to be precise about it. No, the earliest signs of farming uh, in the New World. So um, uh, earliest signs of, of, uh, of farming. Uh, and farming is here being used as a supplement rather than a primary means of, uh, of subsistence. Uh, but of course, the, the, the crop that gets the real press in uh, Mesoamerican archaeology for uh, farming is, uh, is not squash, it's not beans, it's the, the crop that formed the basis of the diet for uh, m most Mesoamerican people over the last 6,000 years or more, and that is uh, corn. So we're going to do a little, little corny archaeology. Um, corn, or zea maize, uh, referred to as maize, uh, M-A-I-Z-E, maize and blue. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the sites that gives us a lot of information about uh, that is the site of Tehuacan. Uh, Tehuacan has is, is got excellent preservation because it's a cave site, um, and we have um, a lot of uh, material that would have rotted away in other places is being uh, preserved because this area was, was sheltered uh, and protected and a lot of the, the things that were dropped in here were kept dry. So here's an image of, uh, of one of the sites in the Tehuacan Valley under excavation. Uh, Tehuacan is not a single site, but it's actually several different sites, uh, actually uh, uh, several hundred different sites uh, collected over um, uh, uh, and studied over the 1960s and the 1970s. Here's just a map to show you where we, where we are. We're also in southern uh, Mexico, um, the uh, uh, area of uh, uh, the Valley of, of Oaxaca here, where, where Gila Naquiz is located, and there's Tehuacan a little further uh, north. Uh, for your sort of future reference, um, the, uh, the uh, Mayan uh, societies that we'll talk about are, are going to be sort of uh, spread over this part of um, uh, of Mexico and, and uh, present-day Guatemala and Belize and Honduras, uh, and uh, the Olmec uh, areas will be sort of in here. Uh, so we're, we're kind of, uh, uh, we're, we're several thousand years before those more well-known developments, but we're in kind of the area that was the, the one that, uh, that, uh, that led to a lot of this. As I said, um, 
uh, Tewa Khan sites, uh, a collection of a bunch of different sites uh, that received a lot of attention in the 1960s and 70s by a lot of archaeologists uh, who were interested in a very systematic uh, scientific uh, application of archaeology, which is sort of new at that time to, to, to collect data um, in quite such a large scale. Uh, it, they, they collected s uh, data from sites that span about 12,000 years and um, they, they are really intending to, to look at the rise of agriculture. They find that it becomes uh, in Tehuacan area a, a, a major element of the diet uh, from about 6,000 BC, so about 8,000 years ago, um, you know, on the, on the uh, uh, little after the uh, Gila Keys where we have just some tiny little hints of it. Uh, it begins to, uh, by about 6,000 BCE, about 8,000 years ago, uh, at Tehuacan we start seeing a, um, uh, an emphasis on uh, farmed, uh, farmed resources. Um, uh, we see Zia Mays, and there's the spelling of the scientific name Zia Mays, M-A-Y-S, uh, as opposed to the, the modern uh, use uh, uh, of the, the modern name for it, maize, which most, most Americans tend to call corn, uh, is here, uh, M-A-I-Z-E, more familiar to us all as a, a color, maize and blue. Uh, we see that Zia maize, um, what we would often call corn, starts to be farmed as a major component from about 4,000 BC, so about 6,000 uh, years ago. Um, we, we know that, that, uh, that maize was first domesticated just a little bit before that. We talked about that at the beginning of the food production um, uh, discussion. I, I showed you a little image of Teosinte, that uh, grass that was domesticated into, um, uh, into what we now call corn, and, and how that process took place very rapidly for, you know, by comparison at least to, to biological evolution uh, through natural selection, that human modification through artificial selection really changed Teosinte uh, uh, remarkably quickly into an extremely abundant, uh, or rather a, a crop that produced a, a very large amount of food in a relatively small um, uh, area. Um, but we've got some still, still some major differences in the way that, uh, that farming was developed here in Mesoamerica compared to how it went in the Old World. And as it says actually in two different places on, uh, on this uh, image here, this uh, uh, bullet point, that, uh, that for the majority of the time we're looking at Tehuacan, we're still seeing uh, groups that are somewhat seasonally mobile. There are groups that are, uh, are practicing farming it's certainly, if you want to be uh, uh, precise about it, it's, uh, it's horticulture early on. Uh, it's a, a, a small patch of, of squash, perhaps eventually a small patch of corn, attended for part of the year, maybe left unattended for part of the year. Well, the group moves on and finds other resources that are available seasonally elsewhere. So again, the, these people, they were perfectly capable of farming, but they chose to hedge their bets, and they had the option to hedge their, hedge their bets by uh, pursuing other resources as well. Here's a, a, a chart. It's a little washed out here, but you should be able to sort of see um, the, the sort of rough differences in, in the colors. And uh, the important takeaway here is that we're looking at this um, timeline of about the last um, 8,000 years, well, it's about 7,000, from 6,000 BC to 1,000 AD, so it doesn't show the last 1,000 years or so, but from, from about, about 8,000 years ago until about 1,000 years ago. And because there are so many samples at Tehuacan, because they've looked at so many different sites and they can look at it comparatively, uh, they can really chart how the diet changed over time. Um, this, this chart uh, doesn't have anything here uh, on the vertical axis, on the y-axis, but what you're seeing here is a percentage. So it's 100% here at the top and 0%. And each of these charts, uh, each of these lines is sort of additive to each other. So if you look at all of the food that's being eaten um, at, at the, the beginning point of this clock, uh, this, it looks like um, uh, at the beginning point, you know, all but this tiny little section in the middle, it looks like maybe uh, 45% uh, here is uh, wild plants, and maybe 50% here is hunted game, so hunted animals, and maybe 5% here is uh, these, these cultivated uh, uh, um, plants that are in these two lines here. This one, they, they blur together here on um, in this particular uh, version of the image, sorry for the quality, but this represents both cultivated beans and squash, and other cultivated plants, a number of different plants that were, were domesticated in small amounts. And as this goes on over time, 
This line moves up, which means the area covered by wild plants at any given vertical slice in time is smaller and smaller. So wild plants become smaller and smaller portion of their diet. And the same is true of hunted game, which becomes a smaller and smaller portion of the diet. And what fills in that gap is uh, farmed and domesticated things. So um, a relatively small and steady amount of cultivated beans and squash increase, increasing a bit over time here. Other cultivated plants sort of going up and down. You get the arrival of the domestic dog and uh, uh, turkey here, um, and arrival um, in the sense that they begin to be domesticated there. This, this is uh, um, still long before contact with the rest of the world, so this is a, a, another independent domestication. Uh, but they are using them for food here uh, from about 2000 BC onwards. But the really important part of this slide, and the sort of takeaway from it, is this middle box here, this sort of triangular um, uh, uh, area, which represents corn, maize, zea maize. Um, and you can see that from about 4,000 BC, about 6,000 years ago, it begins to be farmed right around here. And at first, it only slowly increases as a part of the diet for about 1,000 years, 1,500 years. And then starting at about 3,000 BC, um, you have a real explosion so that by um, the time you get to 1000 AD, just 1000 years ago, corn has become a, a very, very large percentage of the diet for these people. Um, we're dealing with a, a, a group of people that are, are slowly uh, adopting uh, this major crop, corn, but it is definitely taking on a momentum in these last, say, 3,000, 4,000 years here on this chart. Um, a key element, though, is to note that wild plants cultivated uh, and, and hunted game continue to be a part of, of the diet for a lot of people here in Tehuacan, even though um, uh, we're, we're into a, a very substantially farmed um, area. Is that true for everyone? No. There are certainly class distinctions. There are certainly uh, distinctions in other parts of, uh, of Mesoamerica. But this is just what we're looking at here at Tehuacan. Uh, but I wanted to sort of point this out as a, a, a way of um, uh, of recognizing that uh, farming doesn't necessarily have to take place as a sudden adoption where uh, people all look over and, and, and say, oh look, farming is so much better, uh, we all need to be farmers and, and forget this, this domestication, or forget this uh, wild plants and wild animals thing. People are intelligent and they'll do what makes sense to them in the environment that they're living in. And here in Mesoamerica, uh, people spent a, a much longer time adopting farming and it became, uh, you know, really for the first um, three or four thousand years that we see on this this chart, the first half of this chart, uh, it, it was not even a majority of the food that was being eaten uh, by most people here in, in uh, Tehuacan. So a different story of the rise of farming uh, there in uh, in Mesoamerica.